All right, welcome to the boardroom. We're here with the one and only KD. How you doing, brother? What's up, bro? What's going on? Man, just uh, bunkered down here in Brooklyn. We got uh, some crazy stuff going on. We got the last dance popping off. Uh, yo, it's, it's crazy. I was You were 10 years old in 97, 98, mm -hmm. uh, the last run with Phil Jackson and, and MJ. What do you remember growing up in PG County about this <laughs> incredible? I mean, Jordan was everything. You know, he was the standard. He was what you strive to be as a as a basketball player. I mean, obviously the shoes, the jersey sales, the commercials, all of that stuff was constant. But uh, when you watched him play, and you just your eyes were always glued to the TV, glued to him, and he just personified winning and competitiveness. And you know, as a young player, I took from that. He has that line: "Win at all costs." Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. When I say yeah. that, how does that translate to Kevin Durant? Well, anything, you know, coach needs you to do it on the floor, anything, you know, you got to be prepared for any situation. I think MJ was always prepared, no matter if you had to hit the game, win a shot, make the game, win a, you know, assist, get a steal, uh, get a block shot. I think he was always prepared for every moment. And, you know, that's what when it all cost means for me always focused, always dedicated to your teammates. Like MJ wanted to win and wanted his teammates to shine as well. So you've seen that through watching him. And as I got older and more mature, I started to realize, you know, some of the tactics that he used, um, you know, was definitely, you know, part of the leadership qualities that he had. It was, it was unique to watch. Like what? Because, you know, it's, it's amazing, man, watching all those games back in the day, like him and Pip or him and Steve Kerr. Like those dudes used to get in fights. Like people thought yeah. like, we get all sensitive now with arguments like you and Draymond back in the day, but that was that was on a daily basis with those guys. Yeah, I mean, that's any team. That's just the culture of sports, culture of basketball. You get into it with your teammates, you're around them so much. You compete and practice against them on the planes, playing cards. And, you know, so you're just competing and just in an environment with your teammates every day. It just, it breeds that competition. So, but to see how he led by example every night was the same. You know, he dominated. And that was simply, that's just simply the best leadership quality is to go out there and play a game as hard as you can, play to win, and play at that elite level, you know. And he was at that masterful level of, of, of you know, just his skills for the game, his IQ for the game, and just and his athleticism, it all combined at once and made just a, you know, God-level player, in my opinion. Let's speak about that masterful level, man, because we – there was one time in L.A. where you and I, we sat there and we watched MJ clips for about an hour and a half. Like, mm -hmm. I, see, I see the way you watch it. I see the way you study it. You know, what are aspects of his game that you think were just different that people don't talk about? His attention to detail. Um, Michael, Michael was a pure shooter, too. Uh, a lot of people didn't label him as a pure shooter because of his athleticism, but I think that he was one of the best shooters to ever play, top five, top ten shooter to ever play. Everything was bottoms. So I tend to watch that because you only hear about your airness and Air Jordan, but to see that the attention to detail to his fundamentals was something that stood out the most, especially as I got older and started to watch more. And I started to realize what the fundamentals of the game really means. Uh, but you get you you get it just amazed at his athleticism, but to see the attention to the footwork, you know his body placement on his shots, you know when time and score, everything it was just perfect. Take me talk to me about the footwork though, Kev, because I think that's one of the people see the dunks, people see the fadeaway shots, the angles mm -hmm. of attack, right? But the the feet of Michael Jordan, it was like watching a, a ballet dancer out there on the court with the positioning of each angle of his feet all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he moved with such grace. I think uh, putting him in a system like the triangle kind of, I felt sharpened his, his tools up a little bit more. You know, MJ, when he first came in, uh, it was just roll the balls out and go get us a bucket, you know. So once you put him in a, a structured system where he had to play off other players, you've just seen him, you've seen him go to another level because he's, he mastered every aspect from making a pass to, to cutting off the ball to catching and shooting and playing in isolation. So I think Phil Jackson unlocked a lot of that stuff for him, and he displayed it at an elite level every night. You get a chance to watch the docu? No, nah, I didn't. I didn't. I'm looking forward to it. I want to see it in real time with everybody else. Uh, but I know it's going to it's going to be a it's, it's going to be the talk of talk of social media for the next couple of weeks, especially as we go through these series. So I'm excited about it. Man. 
I'm curious because you, you, you watch a lot of details on a lot of people, but I know in particular with MJ, man, it wasn't just on the court, but I know you pay attention to a lot of things about the way he lived. Yeah. Uh, what do you think people are going to walk away thinking about MJ after we open up Pandora's box about how he had to do it, right? Yeah. Different than how other people would did it. He had a high demand, high standard yeah. of success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's methods are different in how they approach their work. And, you know, MJ was in a unique position being handed the league and carried the torch for from Magic to Bird and went to MJ and he carried it well, you know, in the face of the NBA and made it global. And to see how how well he handled that along with, you know, um, on the court, playing with different teammates, going through different series, you know, playing a team in the USA. I just think he, he had a perfect balance between what he wanted to portray off the floor and how he carried the league as a face, but also how he just dominated and didn't care what people said about his game on the, on the court. So he was he just securing himself, securing his skills, and, you know, he walked with that confidence every single day, and you can see it, you can feel it. All right, we're going to do a little exercise, man. We're going to have you rate we're going to go through Jordan's skill sets because yeah, mm-hmm. I know you appreciate the details of the game, right? So yeah. one is the best, five is subpar. All right, not so mm-hmm. good. So you get a chance to rank one through five. Mm-hmm. Psychologically, how do you rank Michael Jordan? The scale of one to five? One to five. One being the best, five being the worst. <laughs> one. One. Ball handling. One. One in ball handling. Yes. Ball what, handling what? to me isn't is it just if you can shake your defender, it's about can you initiate the offense? Can you make plays for other? Can you get off the glass and push? Do your coach trust you to have the ball all possession? You know, can you pass with the left, pass with the right? Yeah, that's ball handling me. MJ was straight to the point. He didn't need five or six crossovers to beat you. You know what I'm saying? He's going to get the two dribble pull up and it's right there. He got, he had his spot. So ball handling to me is much more than just how fancy you could get. Plus there was no, there was no wasted motion, like you just said, exactly. though. And that, exactly. was a lot, that was a byproduct, too, of the triangle because he always caught that ball at the pinch post and those operations to actually execute. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Defender. One. Why? It was his athleticism and his body type allowed him to be versatile, long arms, big hands, fast feet, so he can switch between guard ones, twos, threes, sometimes fours back then, and, maybe, and then come help a lot with his length and athleticism in the post on five. So he was coming off of – you know, uh, when so, – so say if you throw it into the post and Jordan's man cutting off, trying to get out the way, he'll V back and try to get a steal and use his hands and create ca- havoc on defense. So he was basically helping everybody. Uh, him and Scotty was so great at helping everybody and roaming around and also actually playing one-on-one defense. So his positioning was perfect. Like, his hands was perfect. And he played with toughness. So, yeah, I'll say one. You know what, too? Like, his uh... – you talked about the attention to detail, though, but his timing, though, Kev, like, yeah. the time, you know, like timing. Do you ever do that defensively watching him? Like you watch him pace dribbles, right? Like catch your yeah. cadence with your dribble and yeah. like make you lean one way or another. It was like a cat-like yeah. reflection. Yeah, that's why the black cat. You know, he 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 deceptive. You know, he'll he'll butter you up before the game and, and call you his boy and, and 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 have a cigar with you after the game, but doing his doing it. Don't know those 48 minutes, he's at your head. He's trying to figure out the best way to destroy you. So those are the, you know, he he displayed that on the defensive side. He was just so deceptive all the time. You know, being patient, patient, then to still present himself, then boom, he got it. Mid-range jumper. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> like, <laughs> <I didn't run. laughs> oh. But I it was always – it was always the angles, though. Like, he always, he was a master at angles of elevation. And it's like even a slight lean determining, like, your your wingspan. It was just different. Yeah, he was – yeah, man. He, like I said, he was a pure shooter. Like, I don't think anybody in the league at that point was shooting the ball better than him. He was shooting 50-plus percent from the field at the guard position, shooting all Js. Like, you have to be a pure shooter. And everything was touching bottoms. Like, yeah, one, zero. You go zero with that one. Deep ball. Three ball. Mm, see, that's the one. He didn't shoot a lot because he was so dominant inside the three-point line. He didn't need to shoot any. But when he did, he still knocked some down. But I give I'll say, I'll say a I'll say a three. Three. So in 95-96, he, he shot his best three-point shooting percentage, 
and he took crazy. his second most attempts in his career at 260. His most attempts was the next season at 290. Stephen Curry, his most, attempt, his most attempts, 886. Yeah, he shoots about 10, 10, 11 a game. So that's his game, to shoot three. Uh, and Mike's game was more so mid-range. But both guys can go back. Like, Steph can go inside the three-point line and do damage. But he wants to do more damage outside the three-point line. That's what makes him unique. MJ is pretty much everywhere. He can shoot the three. He can get to the rim. He can pull up for the mid-range. So, you know, it, his volume on threes, it was, I think it was perfect for his game. And, you know, so each guy is different. With his attention to detail and his craft in today's game, the most he ever averaged in the career in his season was 37 points per game. 37 points per game, right? And yeah. a true shooting percentage for his career, Kev, 56.9. 56.9. So if he what's were it, what's his what's his regular field goal percentage? True shooting percentage, I don't really care too much about that because it's like, did you shoot 50% for the game or not? All right, true. regular season, uh throughout his career, 49.7. Yeah, that's for a guard, for a two guard, six six. Yeah. I mean, that's enough, enough said right there. I mean, it's hard to do that. It's hard to shoot 50% in a season, much of a game, but to do it for a career at what 30, how many points? 30.1? 30.1. Yeah. And the pace of the game was drastically slower. I'm curious from somebody that plays in today's pace and space with the amount of three balls that today's game shoots, how do you, how do you, what do you think Jordan will average? Where do you think he would fit in? I mean, he can adapt his game to anything. He would fit in as the best player in the league. Like, <laughs> that's what he would be. And, you know, I feel like if he'll have more possessions to do more things. But there's also more athleticism in this game. It is more length in this game. But, you know, it's, it's also in more space for MJ to go to work. So, I mean, we'll never know. But for sure, I mean, he's a master, you know, masterful basketball player. Like we've been saying, his skill level is unmatched. So, of course, he'll, he'll do numbers in this league today. Okay. Passing. For his career, he averaged 5.3 assists per game. Yeah, but he also averaged, what, 32, 8, and 8 one season. He also had like 10 out of 11 uh, triple doubles. Like his game was to score the ball. He didn't need to assist as much because the offense was just solely built on him scoring from out of the high post or in the post. So no need for him to get eight or nine assists, but he was a, a elite passer. I would give him a zero too. Two. Teammate. A zero, I mean. I mean a one. I give him a one. Okay. Teammate. This one's interesting to gauge depending upon what viewpoint you have. Yeah, I just don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. you hear stories, but you don't know how MJ was, you know, every morning. You know, you might have a couple stories that got out, but who knows what he was like one-on-one -on -one unless you were there. So I can't really say much. But if he was on my team, I would definitely, uh, you know, obviously going to challenge you and hold you accountable, but that's what you want from the best player on your team. And on top of that, I would have just been soaking up all the knowledge. So I would say he was, a, you know, the – Teammate, I would give him a one for that too, because he he displayed everything you want from your leader, from somebody who's going to take you to that promise land. He made sure everybody was on board with it, with what the goal was. So yeah, I've seen uh, him elevate, especially in the post, Kev. Like I see your shoulders, the way you move. When you watch Jordan on a block, what do you take away? Uh, just his IQ for uh, when to bring out certain moves, like. And he simplified the game for himself. Like, he didn't need to give you two or three shoulder shimmies. He might just uh, look at you in your face, get your pump fake, look at, see, look for his teammates. And then if not, jab to a J, you know. So then turn around either side. That was it. That's what made him uh, you know, super unpredictable where he can turn over at either shoulder. So, he, you know, it was just, it was just his IQ for when to bring out certain moves. And last question, what's your favorite MJ moment, man? Hmm. I would say when he came to play for the Wizards. I mean, I know all the championships and all that stuff. I mean, never, never disrespect or discredit those. But for me personally, when he decided to come play in my hometown, I just felt so inspired, you know what I'm saying? Because you hear about MJ all the way up until that point, and it seems like he's so far away, and now he's in, a, in the same city, and I can catch a train down there and go catch a game and see the greatest player. Play. Even though he was older, he was still killing. Averaging 20, getting 40s, 
you know, still good looking good in the mid range. So yeah, that was probably my that was probably the most inspiring moment when he came to the Wizards. So that's the boardroom special with Kevin Durant. Yes, sir. Oh, Can't wait to watch the doc.